Well, why don't we uh, move on? Uh, I'm going to uh, load up Adina's slides here. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, but that's there have been a lot of questions that have been coming in, and I'll uh, go ahead and get to those in, uh, after Adina's talk here. No, I think we're, we're – oh, yeah. No, we should be all right on this. Um, it's coming up. I enabled both of them, so we're set. Okay. Um, so uh, Adina's going to do a sound check because she's up in the oak trees as we speak. Uh, so if you hear bluebirds in the background, uh, she's uh, – opened her window or something. So Adina, why don't you do a test and, and then I'll introduce you in just a minute here. But go ahead and do a test, uh, Adina. I don't see any bluebirds out my window, but I do have an amazing red bud flowering. And I will speak loud and hopefully slower than my usual pace to make sure you all can digest my voice. Um, if anyone is not here, well, let's see. Why doesn't someone write in that they can hear? Okay, people, okay, Ryan, thanks for your help, Daryl, loud and clear. So we're in good shape. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Adina. Adina is also uh, a cooperative extension specialist and also a professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, she uh, is housed up in the North Coast. She works out of Mendocino County, both in the extension office as well as the Hopland Research and Extension Center. Adina has done a lot of work on the interface of uh, planning and uh, conservation biology and uh, oak woodlands. Uh, a lot of work that uh, you know, you, she'll, she'll reference right here. Uh, but uh, we'll have a chance to see some of her work on riparian uh, management and the effect on steelhead habitat for those of you who have a chance to go up to the Hopland Research and Extension Center uh, in, in April. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Adina. Uh, hopefully, you can advance it yourself. But if you if you don't see the arrows there, I'll I'll advance it for you. All right, Rick. Um, well, I, it's a pleasure to join you all in this call. Of course, I'm looking forward to meeting some of you in the field, which will be far more fun up here in Hopland. Um, and this talk really is about what planners like to do, which is plan for the future. Unfortunately, we don't always have the luxury for planning for the future, and we end up in sort of reacting to very pressing issues um, that we are trying to address. Um, but I think it's important that we try to spend time thinking about um, the future um, as planners, even though our day-to-day -day activities can sometimes prevent us from this process. Rick, I see one arrow, but it. Let me try. It's it's a pointer. Let me go ahead. I'll just advance it. So I don't see an advance. Oh wait, sorry, Rick. I do. Let me try this real quick. Thanks for the recommendation. All right, I think I've got it. Um. So the importance of this issue cannot be understated, and that is that population is on the rise in California. Um and. I often look at figures like this that we see on our screen, the estimates in millions um, that are going to be increasing in the state of California. Uh, at present, we're at about 36,961,000 people, 36,961,664 million. 36, people, and that was in 2009, so we're probably approaching close to 38 million now. And as we see on this chart, we can go above 50 million by 2050. <clears throat> but what does this really mean? How do we digest those numbers for ourselves? And the way I think about this is what this means is by the time my children, who are now in middle school, attend university, hopefully in California, will be adding the number of people that live in New York City to the state of California. So I don't know how often you all are in New York, but you can imagine what it's like to walk in Manhattan. And you can imagine adding all those people to our state, what that really means for us. In this particular talk, I'm going to talk about what it means for uh, land use change and how the consequences of that land use change affect the biodiversity in Oak Woodland. 
Another shocking figure would be to also add in the number of people that live in the state of Texas, which is eventually what we will be doing. So um, this really brings home how many more people we're going to be adding there. Next 24 million uh, are the number of millions of people that live in this, the entire state of Texas. But it's not just the numbers, and I think we all appreciate that. We have a changing population demography that we have to think a little bit about when we think about the future of California and uh, what will constitute the population. And I show this graph to demonstrate the difference between our age structure in California as we look at it on the left side in 1990 and on the right in 20, what we're estimating for 2030. And the first thing you'll notice is in the mid-age groups, um, in the 20 to 45-year-old group, which are in a slightly different color, at least on my screen, in the middle of this bar graph, we see naturally more people in that mid-age group, which is a um, earning population, a population that is hopefully out in the workforce and contributing to a tax basis. Whereas later in our population, and by 2030, we don't see that large bump in the population at that age group. What we see is a fairly even curve of population of, of age um, within our population. So we see a large number of young people, infants, and young children, and an equally large number of people also in the mid-working ages, and as well as in senior ages. So this obviously is going to change a lot as far as our demands on our resources and our ability to meet those demands in the future. I think it's important to note that um, in 2030, one in every four people will be over 60 as individuals walk around um, the state of California. And um, they estimate that 30% of the state residents will be foreign born. Now, this obviously is influenced by the number of people that we may need to recruit to meet our workforce, which has everything to do with what we do with education in the state today. Because if we can educate our citizens well enough to meet the job demands for California, then it's likely that we'll draw, it will need to draw fewer immigrants into the state. So um, all of these projections are influenced by different variables that we have not, are not fully informed. However, they do come from the state and they're the best that we have to work um, with to do our planning. So that brings me to this point about education, which I just think is very important to uh, realize the dropout rate that we're dealing with right now, um, which can run from 20 to 25 percent um, in different uh, groups or different socioeconomic classes in California, we see that we won't really be prepared to meet the demands of this future population and that we're only expecting one-third of the college-age students in 2030 to actually become college graduates, which is going to influence, again, a feedback loop to immigrants and to the number of people that the state will need to actually support. All right. So, that's all a little grim, <laughs> but uh, it's important to understand because the population numbers and the age structures are the building block of understanding what our future land use patterns are going to be. And that, in turn, and we'll see how we get there, um, will impact the woodland resources that everybody's been talking about so far. So it's critical that we try to understand population trends and we try to understand land use change. And we also try to understand the causal relationship between land use and the natural resources of interest. What we're seeing here is a first graphic to talk a little bit about where this growth might occur based on some modeling exercises that have been done recently. And this particular one, where the darker purple areas are, in fact, um, numbers of people, so the darker the purple gets, the uh, higher the population density is expected to be between the years 2000 to 2050. So it is a density change map. And the density that's going to change, in other words, the number of people added per square mile, is 
what the color bar represents. So the darkest purple is 1,000 to 1,768 people being added to the to per square mile in that location. And as we all would expect, we see uh, a lot of forecasted density changes in Southern California and in the San Francisco Bay Area. But what I'd like to show you all, as you're sitting all in different places in the state of California, is that there are substantial density changes throughout the woodlands um, and throughout the foothills of, and really throughout California. But if you remember those earlier maps of where oak woodlands are and foothills, you'll see overlap between the whole purple area and California's oak woodlands. The other point is that the lighter purple is zero to 50 additional people, but even in rural lands, if you think about 50 additional people per square mile, that can really impact the types of core woodlands and wildlands that we have out in the more remote areas. So it's not just to focus your attention, of course, in these high density areas where we're going to have rapid and substantial change, but even places where the change may go slower and may not seem as intense, it can have a very large effect if you're starting from a very natural baseline, a very, won't say pristine, but a more uh, natural area. The graph on the right, I won't belabor the point, it's just simply also showing the numbers increasing in millions for the San Francisco Bay Area for uh, an example over time. All right, so we can look at this data that we're, we've been mapping um, in part thanks to John Landis, who did quite a bit of work with the state of California on mapping and forecasting land use change statewide by county. And I'm highlighting the same point here. We see huge changes. Each color bar, the top color bar, which is redder or more burgundy, is forecasted out to 2100. The blue to 2050, and the yellow was a, it came from a 1990 original census, so it went out to 2000. Um, in all cases, we see the counties that we might expect. Some of the Central Valley counties, San Diego, Imperial, having substantial growth. But again, we see significant growth in some of these places that uh, still have extensive amounts of habitat um, and doubling population size will impact those regions. Uh, um, I believe in some cases it might be more if they don't have infrastructure um, as far as urban services to handle the increase in densities. And I'll talk a little bit about that hypothesis that I'm proposing about the difference between the impacts of population on rural lands as compared to the impacts of population on urban areas. Of course, the urbanized land area will increase, and um, this also simply takes the models that John Landis um, developed and examines how much of the footprint that I showed you in purple would actually be urbanized areas um, inside uh, urban uh, service boundaries as compared to other types of land. Um, so this is where he's really drilling down to these maps of forecasted land use, and we see this um, developed for the uh, Los Angeles County, Riverside County area, and Orange County, a three-county triangle, and the projected amount of urban areas, uh, the earliest projections are the lightest color, and then we go all the way up to, he projects this 2060, uh, I believe. Um, tw might be, sorry, to 2050 um, in the darkest orange. So each of those are periods of time. I'm getting my own copy out here so I can read the legends better. All right, so it, it is uh, 20, the, the medium orange is 2020 and the darker orange is 2050. And this is new expected urban footprint change. Okay, so just urban development. But I think the real question, as the slide suggests, is certainly not 
if we're going to grow, because we know we're going to grow the population, no matter what population projections you look at, California population will go up. They differ on magnitude that the different models project, but in all cases, it's an upward trend, fairly substantial. I don't know if your guy's screen went off the mic. It did, yeah. I'll bring it back. So when we think about how we're going to grow, one of the key factors, and this is not missed by, by most of you, is how much infill we're going to be able to do in those projected urban areas. So I've been arguing that, yes, there's going to be a lot of population growth, and yes, it's going to expand urban um, development. And one of the big questions is how much of the population will be able to be absorbed into those urban areas. And um, Governor Schwarzenegger worked with his administration, has um, collaborated with John Landis while he was a professor in landscape um, architecture and urban planning at UC Berkeley to look at his models, but from the perspective of modeling the capacity of urban areas to absorb infill, so to build in existing footprint. He did it through a fairly creative modeling exercise, um, an economic modeling exercise that falls under generic economic modeling of, called hedonic regression. Rick is very familiar with these. But what he was looking at was the value of existing structures as compared to their potential value. And in that, suggests that those structures inside urban areas, those existing building footprints, that really aren't valued at what they could get in the marketplace, means that there's room for sort of renovation and improvement. And he used that estimate to add additional occupancy rate to those types of parcels. And it was done on a land parcel by land parcel scale, quite a, a large data set for most urban areas in California. And through those estimates, he actually estimated the amount of future population that could possibly be absorbed in some different um, cases, in other words, our best case scenario, worst case scenario, for improving our ability to do infill and um, came up with estimates that the Schwarzenegger administration was interested in, which is sort of how much is going to be absorbed within our city, right, within our footprint, versus how much is going to, it cannot be fulfilled um, if we don't do something about this. And this actually led to some state bonds that support additional infill. So his finding was that the infill housing, based on his estimates, roughly could observe 25% of the housing needs in the next 20 years. Um, what this suggested is that some policy changes, which they began to work on, and some funding mechanisms to increase infill could improve it to 33%. Now, what the slide is also demonstrating is something we know, which is development, urban development, is the flip side of the same coin of conservation land, isn't it? I mean, conserve, land conservation of large landscape is it, in directly impacted by how much and sustainable development we can do inside urban landscapes because it relieves the pressure on the rural landscapes. And so he actually worked on these estimates of how low density development of 10% infill would, if you only had 10% infill, in other words, that was all you accommodated you would lose 5.1 million acres of habitat to additional conversion. So what he was trying to do was estimate for every additional 5 to 10 percent infill how much land conversion would be spared. And this was a very strong argument for you know, working on, on these new policies, these land use policies. And he showed that, in fact, it falls off this slide, but that if we could increase infill to 30%, that then we would drop that 5.1 million acres of habitat conversion down to 2.6 million acres. So it shows right in there that point that I'm saying about the flip side of the coin, obviously. What you accommodate in urban affects what you can conserve in, in the rural landscape. I think it was a very persuasive uh, use of science to influence policy. 
Greg has shown this slide and pointed to the same issue we're seeing here and hopefully reemphasizes the point I'm trying to argue in this talk, and that is that, we, yes, of course, of course we're expecting a lot of land use change. We are certainly expecting some urban growth, in other words, urban footprints will uh, expand, but if, and those are the red areas. But what is really jumps out at us is, yes, the red areas grow, but the yellow and light orange areas, which represent the medium and low density development, consume the green woodland. So this is really taking that purple picture and the original kinds of foothill maps that we've been showing and puts it all together for you. As you see, the demand for low density development as forecasted by David Theobald here, based on Census Bureau blocks, consumes our woodlands fairly rapidly. Again, the picture that we still have time to influence these yellow blocks, these, this picture, and that's where Landis was going. He's saying, let's get more into those red areas so that we can decrease the pressure on those burgeoning yellow and orange areas in this graph. That. I'm going to try again to see if we end up with a black. So, okay. All right. Um, this is simply more zoomed in changes in urban development. And this is the Los Angeles County area, Riverside County again, and San Bernardino. And what we're seeing here, my, my years out, is 1998 as mapped by Don Landis in the urban footprint. And he builds that out to 2020. This is a spatially explicit urban build out model, um, and then goes out to 2050. And of course, anyone who does, who looks at these models or people intuitively will know that the farther we forecast away from present, the more uncertainty there is in the patterns that we can predict. Um, but he does go ahead and go to 2100. Um, in figuring this out. And you see infill and you see expansion of this urban footprint as we expect. This is a uh, Sonoma County map, and uh, this is where I've been working in, on land use dynamics for 15 years now. And it uh, really exemplifies the point that I am uh, expressing today, which is, again, there is a high probability in Sonoma County that uh, very high density development will expand outside the city boundaries. And here we're looking in the middle of the photo, a picture of, of Sonoma County is the Highway 101 that runs north-south. We have several bifurcating highways, one that crosses the city of Santa Rosa in the middle of the map. The pinkish and red areas are areas, dark pink and dark red, are areas that we expect future um, High density development to increase, and this is really only out. To, this was a 12, 2000 to 2020 model. It doesn't go very far into the future, but the areas of future urban development are contained along the highway corridors as we forecast this, this information based on previous development patterns. However, the probability of low density development is much more unconstrained, as we see in blue. And this low density development is highly likely between the major highways in Sonoma County and throughout southern Sonoma County. Of course, it's less likely in the northwest part, where the mountain ranges get quite uh, steep and difficult to drive throughout. But we see the footprint. While the density is lower, the footprint is far more extensive. So same thing that we see California-wide, we can demonstrate this on much more informed models at county by county level. And those of you who are familiar with this program, UPlan, developed out of UC Davis by Bob Johnson's lab, uh, this model is now running for all counties. And I highly recommend it if you're in a rural county, because it is particularly good, better than the land response, at predicting um, rural residential development in rural counties. About five minutes, Adina. Okay. So what
what does this development look like in a woodland? And this is one of the things that's been difficult to get at. Uh, what does it mean both on the ground as far as the loss of our resources? And Chris and Beard did this nice mapping exercise. And we'll, because we're running short on time, I won't tell you all the details of it. But what you're seeing is mapped the road network and the houses of low-density development on top of an aerial image of a woodland in the Lassen foothill. So we were able to quantify sort of the built environment that results in what sometimes is often just referred to as somewhat benign types of development. <clears throat> and um, let me go on to the biology, save you some time on these forecasting maps. These are similar arguments for the fact that low density development can consume large areas of land. And talk about the impact to those resources that we're so concerned about. So what, is these, what do these changes mean for habitat? What do they mean for fragmentation, for biodiversity, for water resources? This is really where the emerging science is. And of course, it can be complicated because these are somewhat complex ecosystems that we work in. And there's a lot of change going on in them. And it can be hard to boil down the, hopefully, sort of somewhat the tighter relationships or potentially causal relationships between our actions as far as land use and the ecosystem's response. And Bill touched upon this a bit when he started talking about losing certain habitat features. In this particular study, it simply shows that when we go out and look at bird species that are known to be sensitive to urban environments, there are um, evidence that they are also found at lower densities in these low density urban environments that I was showing pictures of, for instance, those last and foothill environments with a low density housing development. This particular data is taken from the North Coast. But what we were surprised to find in some cases is that, for instance, for the hunt area, the orange, orange crown warbler, um, we see that the exurban areas had as low detection rates as suburban areas and that, in most cases, the undeveloped areas have higher detection rates. Now, some species respond to exurban areas similarly as if they were undeveloped. And some species seem to be responding and having an aversion to low-density development. So it's by no way a uniform response to exurbia. That predicting what happens in exurban areas can be quite complicated. This slide simply shows, um, well, it's actually a lot of work to go into hopefully somewhat of a simpler slide. <laughs> um, what we're looking at here was a study we did in my lab where we were interested in how changes, percent incremental changes in land use in a watershed influence the in-stream conditions that have been observed in that watershed. And Fish and Game did a nice job of taking a lot of data on something called embeddedness, how much fine sediment is in spawning gravel. And on the left picture, you see clean spawning gravels. On the right, highly embedded, lots of fine sediment. People have studied this extensively, especially in the Northwest, in forestry systems, um, for urban development. So they, and so they understand a lot about how much urban development you can add and how much response you get, what's the level of response you get in the stream. What they hadn't studied a lot was other types of development, and in this case, we looked at urban, just like everyone else, and you see that steep curve, so that for every added percent of urban, we see a decrease in the probability of detecting low sediment pools, clean or gravel. And you see it's quite steep, so every little percent of urban, we see a big impact on the change in finding, the probability of finding a clean pool. So rural residential, as you might expect, you can handle a lot of, a lot of amounts of rural residential. You see changes, but not severe changes. It's a much gentler marginal effect. However, because we expect so much more change on the landscape, in other words, we expect, as those maps showed you, Small amounts of urban, yes, you know, certain number of acres of urban. But when we're talking about changes in low density development, in some places in California, we're talking about tens of thousands of acres being impacted. So while the incremental 
environmental effect of every single acre of low density development isn't as pronounced in stream quality. When you add all the amount of land that gets converted into that habitat type, it can end up, in this case, as we showed, more significant of an effect. So we face, in closing, these land use challenges. And I hope I've just introduced you and provided necessary justification for what we want to do as planners anyway, which is need to think out into the future, forecast into the future, try to better understand the consequences of the choices we make to better inform those choices. Um, and there are challenges that I thought I might pull it out for you <laughs> with respect to thinking about land use based on the focus that I provided. Um, certainly, scaling up is always a challenge. We can sometimes think get very informed situations on a case-by-case -case study, but it's hard for us to sort of generalize regionally and certainly um, across the state. Um, we need to think about management of uh, growth boundaries and cities and integrating our, our urban and our rural planning, which is always a big challenge because it often happen in separate, uh, usually in separate offices. And despite the fact they affect one another, um, they don't, they're not done integratedly. Uh, but think, of course, we need to think more about rural sprawl, not from just the perspective of wildlands, which I've shared, but also from the perspective of prime agriculture. And I sort of skipped through some of those slides, but it's all related, as, as you all probably appreciate. If you put aside prime farmland, you then push out housing, and that housing then goes into foothills and to often into woodlands. So the choices that we're making about agricultural protections, prime farmland protections for intensive agriculture, influence the pressures on our extensive agricultural lands, such as woodland forest lands, and choices, like I've already said, about urban development influence those as well. So there's feedback loops between those land use choices that have large consequences. And sometimes, because of the complexity, it is helpful to look at modeling and forecasting these things in a spatial way so we can see the outcomes of potential scenarios, choices, and effects. I guess that sort of summed up in the balancing types of land use. They're all interrelated. So is affordable housing because it relates to infill. It relates to all of this work. Um, of course, human health implications for sprawl are huge. And so are the environmental consequences from the perspective of pollution and other issues. So our footprint, how we grow, is affecting not just the environmental points that we're talking about with woodlands, but all kinds of other sort of quality of life metrics. And it affects justice as well as what people have access to. I think we're all in this business. Um, I don't need to belabor that point that we are in the business of taking action. Um, and I would argue the need for more coupling between conservation and land use planning. Um, but I also think that we are poised to help, um, and both from the perspective, I want to say, as a university, but as Rick was saying, as we build a collaborative effort um, among those interested in land use, land use planning and um, oak woodland conservation and environmental um, natural resource conservation, uh, we'll be in a stronger position to couple the, those two areas of study, not I mean, areas of study and areas of practice, which so badly needs to be done if we're going to really come up with some of these uh, potential opportunities. I won't say solutions, but you know, maybe more uh, productive directions uh, toward increased sustainability. All right. What? That's, that's, uh, that's good, Adina.